Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, it's Shay here, and welcome to another episode. I am excited to have you on, as always. And today we are going to be visiting about heifer development, as well as a little bit of offering a little bit of advice with marketing bred heifers. So Shelby's going to dive into that. And I do just want to let you know that Shelby will also be speaking on one of the upcoming Rancher Mind calls. So if you are unfamiliar with Rancher Mind events, these are events that I put on over Zoom for cattle producers to connect with industry experts, as well as some of their peer cattle producers to really learn from each other. So each month we dive into a different topic. Quarter three of this year is focused on cattle marketing, but it's a little different than what cattle marketing we talked about last year. Last year, we focused a lot about marketing steers. This year, we're going to talk about some of the other cattle marketing aspects that you can think about. Um, This will be valuable for both commercial and seed stock producers, because in July, we're going to be talking about marketing cattle in an online world. So think about building up your ranch brand through websites, social media, and other avenues, and just thinking about how you can diversify yourself with your marketing strategy to really connect with the right people. August is going to be focused on how to add value to your calves. So we're going to look at different value added programs, different methods of selling your calves and really dive into different options on what cattle producers can do and how you can really try and get the best value for the product you're selling. And then September is where we're, where we will have Shelby and she's going to be talking about marketing bred heifers and coal cows. So If you want more information on that, there is a link in the show notes or the description, or you can message me on social media. My social medias are at cattle convos. My email is also in the show notes as well. If you'd prefer to reach out to me there, but we can talk about it and figure out what's best for you. So with that, let's get on with today's episode and hear what Shelby has to say. Well, good morning, Shelby. I'm excited to have you on the show today because this topic, you know, we're going to be talking about heifer development and maybe a little bit about marketing bred heifers. That is something that's been requested for probably a couple of years now. So my audience has been wanting to hear about this. So I'm glad to have you on to talk about it and uh, appreciate you joining me today. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for reaching out. I'm always happy to talk about heifer development. It's kind of one of my favorite things to discuss. So um, I appreciate you having me on the show. So on that note, will you talk a little bit about who you are and what your role is in the beef industry today and the heifer development space? Awesome. So um, I actually grew up on a cow-calf operation in um, Jamestown, California. It's a little town in central California um, where the rest of my family is. So Um, Grew up in the ranching background on a cow-calf operation, um, did my undergraduate degree at Fresno State, uh, focused on um, animal science and ag education, Um, went back to the ranch for a couple years, and then decided I just wasn't done learning. And so I decided to go back to school, um, and I completed my master's and PhD at New Mexico State University uh, in Las Cruces. So went to a totally different area of the country um, and got to see some really different things. Um, and all of my research while I was there really focused on uh, nutritional management and different management strategies with our heifers. And so I really kind of fell in love with um, developing heifers and how we can utilize different management strategies and options and those kind of things to um, get the most fertile and best heifer we can. And um, then when I graduated, um, I took a job here at the University of Wyoming where I'm the state beef extension specialist. Um, so I get to still do a little bit of research, uh, but also be out in the state working with producers and working on educational programming for them um, in the state and in this region. Well, I appreciate you kind of going into what all you've done. And so why heifer development? Why is that one of your favorite things to talk about? Why is that what really makes you passionate about the beef industry and kind of gets you up in the morning? You know, to me, heifers are, that's the future of your herd, right? It's an opportunity for us to really think about where the herd's going to be in five to 10 years. And those decisions we make during that heifer's first year of life have a long-term impact on her. And so to me, they're just 
a really great opportunity for us to be continually looking forward and how can we make things better in the herd, um, especially from a fertility standpoint. Um, but they're just a great opportunity for that. And so that gets me uh, really excited um, about talking about them. That's where my research is still focused. And um, they're just a really unique opportunity for producers. So with heifer development, you said, you know, the decisions we make in her first year of life make a huge impact on how she develops and the type of cow she turns into. Would you say it even starts before that, before the heifer's even born or kind of, I've heard some thoughts on that. So what are your thoughts on that? I know that wasn't necessarily the, the direction of the interview, but just came to mind. So I had to ask. No, that's no problem. Um, absolutely. That's not necessarily the space that my research focuses on. Um, but we know that everything we do to that animal from conception all the way through her lifetime is going to impact her, especially from a fertility standpoint. And so being cognizant of that when we're, when those cows are gestating those calves is something really important. Um, something I like to say when I'm out talking to producers and when I do presentations is fertility isn't a one-time event. And so thinking about that future calf's fertility, even when they're in inside that cow in utero is also really important. And so we know that everything we do, nutrition, stress, health, everything is going to influence that calf for the rest of its life. So as you think about that first year of the heifer's life and heifer development as a whole strategy, what would you say are the main components of a successful heifer development strategy? That's a good question, but it's also a challenging one. And so each operation is different. And I think that's where the challenge comes in, right? Each operation or each ranch has really different resources available to them that they're going to be able to utilize. And they also have really different goals of what they may want to get out of their heifers, what their overall operation goal is and how the heifers work into that. Um, and so I don't think I get asked this a lot. Well, how should I develop my heifers? What's the perfect way to develop a heifer? I don't think there's one perfect way. If you really look through the research and all the work we've done over the past 70, 80 years, it really shows us that there's different ways to develop heifers and still be successful. Now, I think some components that are important is thinking about fertility and reproduction, and that'll keep coming up probably in almost every answer. And that's not just because I'm a trained reproductive physiologist. It's because it's really important, right? That's her whole goal. When we're keeping her, our goal for that heifer is for her to have a calf each year, maintain a 365 day calving interval. And so thinking about heifer development is what can we do to push fertility is really important. And so first thing on that list is puberty attainment. Can we get her cycling before the start of the first breeding season? We know that that is incredibly important. And if we can get her to have one, if not two or three cycles before the start of that first breeding season, that's going to help us be more successful with that heifer and get her bred early in that breeding season. Thinking about calving distribution is also really important, especially as a heifer. There's some really cool research that came out of Nebraska a couple years ago that showed that those heifers that get bred in the first 21 days of the breeding season and calf in the first 21 days of their first calving season stay in the herd longer and they actually produce more pounds of calf over their lifetime. So to me, that's always my big focus when thinking about heifers. You know, I don't care if you put them in the dry lot, if they're out on pasture, if you push towards 65% mature body weight, or if you're a low input system, as long as you can be thinking about how do I get that heifer bred early in her first breeding season, that's going to be really important. How can I develop her to push longevity? That's also going to be really important. So what are some of those factors that impact puberty attainment? So the two big ones are going to be age and then also weight gain. Um, so body condition, we can look at it, look at it a number of different ways. Um, Age, obviously we can't do a lot to change that, but we do know we can use nutrition as a big tool with puberty attainment. Genetics is also gonna play a role there. Um, and so from the nutrition standpoint, um, 
you know, there's always big discussions in the heifer development world of 65% versus 55% and what's the right way to develop heifers. And I think both can be right depending on the selection in your herd and what your cyclicity has been in the past. And that's something when producers ask me about heifer development that I try to focus on a lot is, you know, the last couple of years, what does your calving distribution look like? We have all the heifers calving pretty early in the breeding season, we probably don't have much of a puberty problem, right? If we look at our calving distribution and we only have a handful of calf early, majority are pushing later, maybe heifers weren't cycling right at the start of that. And that could be, maybe they were too thin or nutrition wasn't quite good enough. Um, it also could be a genetics thing. Um, certainly we've done a great job um, in the beef industry, especially in our British and continental or Bos Taurus type cattle of selecting for earlier maturing cattle, we know we can have some issues in our Bos Indicus, more of our Brahmin influence type cattle with them attaining puberty earlier. I don't talk about them much because it's not a big issue in Wyoming. We don't have a lot of Brahmin cattle, um, but that certainly can be an issue for them is getting heifers to cycle early, especially if we're trying to calve at two years of age. And like you said, part of that goes back to when those heifers were physically born, correct? Like, because if those heifers were born on the back end of the calving cycle, then that may impact, you know, what puberty stage they're at when it comes time for breeding season, right? Right. And so when we're thinking about selecting heifers, thinking about when that calf was born can be really important, right? Not that we can't get a calf that was born later to mature in time, we can, um, but you know, maybe it's just harder to get them to mature. I also look at it like if they were born later, is that a sign that maybe the dam that she came from, maybe she wasn't as fertile? Why did she calf later? Why was that calf born later? So you could, it's kind of a rabbit hole you could go down, right? And really be yeah. tracking back all of those kind of things. Um, we also really want to think about age of dam when it comes to selecting those heifers. Uh, we know that heifers born to cows or older dams are typically have a little bit better fertility than those born to heifers. So thinking about that when we're in the pen selecting those heifers. So are you recommending like doing any pelvic scoring for producers? Are you seeing producers, you know, scoring those reproductive tracks before they select for replacement heifers? Kind of what are you seeing in the industry on that front? I know I've talked a little bit about that. I've had Jordan Thomas on the show a couple times and he's touched on it, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on it. I think it can be a really good tool. Um, it can definitely help us look at, you know, her size and capability as a future cow. Um, but I think it depends on, you know, what resources do you have available? Is it easy to get those heifers in and do um, a reproductive tract score or a pelvic exam um, and that kind of score, you know, before the first breeding season and help with selection? I don't think it's necessarily an integral piece that we absolutely have to do. It's also another expense, right? Um, and so for me, when I think about heifers, it also has to pencil out for that producer, right? We definitely need them to be able to have an optimal heifer, right? That she's gonna get bred early and do all the things from a fertility standpoint that we talk about, but she's also not costing them so much that they never break even and get a return on investment on her. And so I think reproductive tract scoring can be a really great tool. It just needs to be something that can work into that operation. Absolutely. You have to look at your input costs already and know the value of your heifers too. And so with that, you know, you talked about having things pencil out. So when producers are looking at developing their own heifers, what economic principles do they need to be keeping in mind? So, you know, to me, when I think about economics and heifer development, I almost want to think of it like a stalker operation where I'm really trying to figure out what are all my input costs? What's the opportunity cost of keeping that heifer instead of selling her? How many feed inputs, health inputs, inputs during the breeding season, all of those kind of things are going into that heifer. And how long is it going to take for me to break even? And there's certainly been some good research and we always say, you know, three to five years, 
but that can definitely change based on feed prices, cattle prices, um, what the market's doing. All of those kind of things are going to influence that. Um, and there was actually a really cool study they did in Tennessee several years ago that you know, showed really the difference. Granted, it was Tennessee, mm -hmm. and so feed prices were maybe a little different there than we'd see in Wyoming, Nebraska, this kind of area. But they actually showed it was going to take eight or nine years for dry lot developed heifers to break even, which is, I mean, at that point, are we really going to make money on that cow if it's taking her that long to break even? And so that's where, as much as I love heifers, and I think you know, retaining and keeping heifers is a really great option. You got to make sure it works for you, right? Do you have the resources to keep heifers around and get them developed the right way from a fertility standpoint at a relatively cheap cost? Folks, thank you for listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. Now, when you're done listening today, if you're looking for another podcast, I'd encourage you to go to The Cattleman's Call. It's a podcast hosted by a Montana rancher, Lane Nordland. You can hear from guests with a variety of unique stories and experiences in the beef industry, from cattle law enforcement officers to veterans turned farmers and cryptocurrency in calf production. They literally cover it all. Stream Cattleman's Call today. So do you have anything else to add to that? You know, because you you kind of led into what I was going to ask next, which was when should you look at selling your heifers versus buying replacements? So do you have anything to kind of add on to that if producers are trying to figure out, you know, what truly is the best option in, the, in that regard? Yeah. And this is, to me, it's kind of a hard question because it's such a personal question for each operation. You know, I obviously have a, a large love for heifers and, mm -hmm. and I can see all the benefits of keeping heifers, right? Keeping those heifers, we have control over how they were raised all the way from when they were inside that cow to birth through weaning. We have control over their nutrition, their health, how they were bred. We have a good idea of what the genetics are and how they've been treated. So there's not a lot of surprises there. Um, and so that control can be really great because we can put a lot of work into selection and development of those heifers over time, but it can also be really expensive, right? Um, depending on the resources we have, keeping those heifers can be expensive, or maybe we don't have the forage resources or a place to keep those heifers around and develop them the way we want. And so maybe when we look at retaining heifers, we don't have as much control over the genetics and over how they were developed and all of those kind of things. But if we're buying from a really reputable source who does all the things that we would want to do, we can still get some really good heifers and maybe there's a benefit of bringing in new genetics and new, those kind of things mm -hmm. into the herd um, that could be really great. It also may be cheaper for us than <laughs> cheaper. <laughs> for us than keeping heifers around, right? So maybe not having to keep those heifers and feed them, depending on the year, it may pencil out for us to actually be cheaper to buy heifers, even a bred heifer versus keeping heifers around. I appreciate you talking about that. And I know like, so my family, we were seed stock producers. So being able to retain our own females is a huge part of our operation because we like that control over the genetics. And we really put a lot of emphasis on, you know, not just what types of bulls are we selling. We put a lot of emphasis on, okay, what types of cows are we trying to raise too, so that they can come back? So what, do you have any examples of like any creative ideas or how you've seen other um, successful producers go about developing their heifers, keeping, you know, input costs in mind? You know, um, I don't know that there's one that specifically comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's been cool. I mean, I started out in California, then being in New Mexico and now Wyoming, very diverse um, locations. And I've been, been able to see some really different ways of developing heifers, um, you know, different endpoints for those heifers. I think it goes back to every operation's unique. And so to me, the first thing I want to do is sit down and look at what resources do I have available to me, right? Do I have forage where I could develop heifers out on pasture and thinking about adaptability of those heifers into their future production environment maybe is really important to me. Do I maybe have a dry lot where I can put those heifers? 
what kind of harvested forage resources do I have then? How much is that going to cost me? I think it comes back to penciling it out a little bit. Um, there's actually a producer up in Sheridan, Wyoming, who, um, you know, we haven't talked specifically about his nutritional management of those heifers, um, but he's really focused on, he wants a short calving window for his heifers and he really wants to push fertility. And so he actually only turns the bull out for 25 days with his heifers. So he keeps a large group of heifers, develops them all together. He's got the forage resources to do that. He turns a bull out for 25 days. And then when he preg checks, anything that was bred in those 25 days, that's his keepers. There may be a couple he gets rid of out of there, but for the most part, those are his keepers. Anything that wasn't bred, he actually still markets as a feeder heifer and has a really great opportunity to market those um, and has done really well from an economic standpoint of short breeding season and then marketing anything that didn't get bred. And so for him, that's great because he's not calving out heifers for two months. He's only calving for about 30 days on those heifers. Um, and we all know how fun calving heifers there <laughs> can be. <laughs> um, and then he's had really good success with marketing those other heifers um, as feeder heifers directly to a feed yard. Well, thank you for expanding on that. So what would you say are some of the biggest missed opportunities or mistakes you see cattle producers make? You know, maybe you've talked about it already, but maybe not. So I have to ask. No, that's a really good question. Um, and so to me, the when I was thinking about this question, because it's one you sent me earlier, um, I think one of the biggest missed opportunities is kind of getting complacent with what we're thinking about, right? We do the same thing with the heifers every year. We keep heifers, we're looking, we like to keep a nice looking, good structured heifer. Um, and we develop her the same every year and not taking a critical look at, is there something we could do different, right? Is there a way to push fertility a little bit more, right? Maybe that's shortening the breeding season or maybe that's keeping extra heifers and at preg check, getting rid of any of the late bred heifers, selling them to somebody else who they fit their calving window. Um, thinking about fertility and longevity can be really important. We can kind of forget that, right? We're doing the mm -hmm. same thing every year. We kind of stop thinking about that. Um, the other thing I think is important is thinking about the adaptability of those heifers. And that was something um, that really hit home with me when I, I was in New Mexico was, you know, they're not going to be a high input operation there because they didn't have the feed resources available to them. And so their goal was to develop those heifers in their future and production environment. They didn't want to baby those heifers along. They really wanted to make sure that the heifers that they kept that were successful as a heifer were heifers that were hopefully going to stay in the herd for multiple years after that. And so I think that can be a really important thing. There's nothing wrong with developing heifers in the dry lot, but maybe we don't have to push 65% or 70% mature, bo mature body weight at the start of the breeding season. Maybe we they don't need to be at a body condition score six or seven when we breed them. Maybe we need to think about if my cow herd is always at a body condition score five, that's maybe where my heifer should be. And that heifer that has to be at a body condition score six, that's the only way she can get bred. Is that really the heifer that I want in my herd as a cow, right? Because she's probably going to fall out as a young cow because we're never going to keep her in nice conditions. Um, one thing I say to my beef production class and in my heifer talks is she has no excuse as a heifer, right? She doesn't have a calf at her side. All she's doing is growing. So if she can't get bred and bred relatively early in the breeding season at a body condition score or in a nutritional plan um, that's similar to what my cows are on, is she worth keeping in the herd, right? Is that really the cow that I want in my herd? Because She's probably going to fall out as that two or three year old first or second calf heifer. And then I've never made my money back on her. So thinking about adaptability of those animals moving forward, as well as fertility, um, I think are some missed opportunities there. You, you packed a lot of great advice in there and great <laughs> questions for producers to ask themselves. So I, I really appreciate that. Now, I know you're going to be on 
one of my upcoming Rancher Mind events coming up in a few months here. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about this and um, talking a little bit about marketing bread heifers too. So I do want to ask you a few questions on that regard. And so if I see a lot of producers, you know, they might not, they'll retain their top heifers that bred and then they'll market the rest of their bread heifers. And they're using that. It seems like a great opportunity for them. So what kind of advice do you have for people who are thinking about marketing their bread heifers and how to go about that? Yeah. I mean, I think this upcoming year is probably going to be really great prices for bread heifers. And we, you know, where we are in the cattle inventory and the market, it's looking like bread heifers should get a pretty good price. So I would anticipate there's quite a few producers probably thinking about that this year. Um, the big thing for me, and I know I keep going back to this, is the economic side of it and penciling it out. What's your cost to get that heifer to the point where you're going to sell her? So figuring out kind of like in a stalker or a background in operation, what's my break even? So what price do I need to get on that heifer to break even and then make a little bit of money? Um, Cause it's really not worth it if we're not going to make money on her. Right. And so I think that's the first thing to think about how much does it cost for me to retain that, those extra heifers, feed them out to that point, get them bread, whatever that may be. And thinking about in the market, am I going to be able to break even? Thinking about the timing of when you're going to market those bread heifers is also going to be really important. You know, we don't want to come in and flood the market with everybody else who's selling bread heifers because we're probably not going to make as much. Um, thinking about those seasonal price trends could be really good there. Um, the other thing is it's kind of like feeder cattle where we really want to think about what's the quality of the animal we're selling. Um, something my dad has always kind of said, you know, we don't sell a lot of bread heifers. Um, and part of that's him going, you know, when you sell that animal, your brand or your name is behind that animal, making sure that we're selling a quality animal. Um, maybe think about if you were buying bread heifers, what would you be looking for, right? A nice quality uniform set of heifers. What are the genetics on those heifers? Do I know, you know, what's the breeding window on those? Are they really spread out? Is there really relatively tight window? Um, th that kind of information could be really important. So, you know, maybe when you preg check, you have a bet, give you ages so that you know, hey, this should be roughly the, the timing or the window that those heifers are bred, having a lot of information available on them. What's the health management? It's kind of like selling a feeder cap, right? How much information can I get? And if you're looking at buying, you want the most information you can, right? I would want to absolutely know what bulls are they bred to, right? Were they Cabernet's bulls? Am I going to have issues with that, right? That's going to be <laughs> a really big thing for us to be thinking about. And so the more information that you can give a buyer, if you're the one selling them, that's going to be really impactful. But again, I think it goes back to penciling it out and making sure it economically is going to be a good option for you. I I appreciate that. And you just touching on that topic. And like I said, um, Shelby will be on the Rancher Mind call. So if you want to get more into the marketing bread heifers aspect, we'll be having that conversation here in the coming months. And there's a link in the description and show notes for that. But Shelby, as we kind of wrap up, to, wrap up today, I want to ask you maybe a little bit more of a fun question for yourself. Not that this conversation wasn't fun because you love talking about heifers anyway, right? But what's been your favorite research project that you've been a part of in the heifer space? Uh, so my favorite research project is um, actually one that I've been continuing. Um, so I've been doing some stair-step nutrition work. So altering the timing of gain. Um, and there was some really cool work that they did in Nebraska that showed um, when we do a stair step um, type system in heifers in the dry lot, we actually increase the number of microscopic follicles and we refer to that as the ovarian reserve. Um, and so in my PhD, I had an opportunity to um, kind of repeat that in a totally different environment in New Mexico, but also add on um, a grazing portion. So instead of just having heifers in the dry lot, I made it more complicated and added heifers out grazing uh, native range. And so um, that was a really cool study because we were able to mimic the results that they saw in Nebraska with dry lot heifers and the native range stair-step heifers having an increase um, 
in the number of primordial follicles or that ovarian reserve. And so that was a really cool study. It's one that I've actually continued on here at Wyoming. So we're doing uh, similar research, um, but now looking at how that influences the uterine environment, how that influences progesterone profiles leading up to the first breeding season. Um, and the joke with one of the um, guys here at University of Wyoming is that eventually I'll leave the ovaries in these heifers and be able to breed them and look at some long <laughs> depth. Um, Nebraska already did a little bit of that um, over at their USDA center there, uh, where they've actually seen uh, those stair step developed heifers have an increase in longevity. Um, and so to me, that's just a super cool project. It shows me that how we manage them again in that first year of life from a nutrition standpoint has a really big impact on them even years down the road and can influence how long they stay in the herd. So that's been a cool project to be a part of. Do you have, um, are there any like website links or something that we could share in the show notes if people want to see anything on that yet? Um, absolutely. I can share the links to the research projects. Um, and even um, I've shared a little bit of that research and some proceedings I did for um, some different meetings um, for Range Beef Cow Symposium and those kind of things. So I can yeah. share those. Yeah. Well, we'll get those in the description then in case uh, people want to dive into more of that information. So to wrap up today, Shelby, is there anything else you want to add on the topic of heifers? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we've covered a lot and I've touched on this a little bit. Um, I think when it comes to heifers, I think we need to be really critical about how we're developing these heifers. Our heifers are a really unique opportunity for us to push fertility in the herd. Um, you know, when we're calling an open cow, we're not necessarily pushing fertility, we're getting rid of a problem, right? But our heifers, they're an opportunity for us to only keep heifers that were bred early or to use different nutritional strategies to push heifers like the stair step system um, for longevity and reproductive traits like that. Um, and so I think be critical about how you're thinking about fertility in those heifers. Are we adapting those heifers to their future production environment? Um, those kind of things, I think that's really going to help a producer be successful when they're thinking about their heifers. Well, thank you for those final thoughts, Shelby. And thank you again for being on the show today. I really appreciate everything you had to share and look forward to chatting with you again in a few months. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.